in our hearts from last in the love of mankind, to the pure light and by divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds and the understanding of our gospel teachings. And that also in us the fear of our blessed commandments. So grant us now in all time of desire. We may enter upon the spiritual manner of us, while thinking and knowing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our Lord. And unto thee do we send us, Lord. Together with thy Father, who is with us again, and in all the holy good of thy giving spirit, now and ever and unto ages. Of each other. Amen. O blessed man, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be unto all. 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 Peace be unto The Lord said this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. That those will those things be which you have provided. So is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Oh, Lord, Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord of Jesus Christ. Lord of Christ. St. John, the evangelist, writes, In Christ, the Word of God incarnate was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not hold him down, or comprehend him, or snuff him out however you want to translate that verb. He was the true light coming into the world. And as many as received him, to them who gave the power to become children of God. This power to become children of God is the power of Christian faith. We receive this faith, this power, if we desire it. It will not be given to us if we don't want it. Because God is love. And love does not force itself on anyone. We cannot generate this power, the saving faith from ourselves, any more than we can give birth to ourselves. We can believe with all our might until we're blue in the face, blue in our soul. We still are not children of God. For to become a child of God is to be born of a power that is not from us, but from God. The devils believe, after all, and they tremble. They do not become children of God, however, because their belief is not Christian faith. It is not love for God. They have no desire to receive God or to become children of God. They desire rather to be their own gods. They desire power, not to serve others, but to serve themselves. St. Paul's doctrine of justification by grace through faith simply cannot be understood outside the biblical faith of the church. And so as not to 
go into an extended treatise on St. Paul's doctrine of, of justification by faith, assuming that I would be able even to do that. Let me hope to illustrate St. Paul's doctrine of the law and biblical faith with certain biblical images. Imagine Christmas without Christ and his most beloved virgin mother. Imagine the cave of Bethlehem without the Virgin and the Christ child. Imagine the Virgin herself without her son, Jesus Christ. Imagine the cross without Christ nailed to it. Imagine the tomb of Pascha without Christ buried in it. Now imagine the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets, if they do not hold within them the word of God. Imagine the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon, without the glory of God filling them, or the sanctuary of the temple, without God sitting atop the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubim, making himself known to Moses and speaking to him from that point. Can you see in the icons that these images from the Bible are drawing in your mind that if there is no Christ in any of these different vessels, they are nothing, just ordinary. They would not be sacred at all. The cave would just be a hole in the mountain. The virgin would just be an ordinary woman. What will Christmas be? We'll just go outside the church and see what Christmas is without Christ. There would be no life in these things. There would be no sacredness to Christmas, no life, no joy to Christmas beyond the presence under the tree maybe the banquet on the table. There will be no life in them. There will be no life that is the light of men. None. There will be only darkness and death. In the same way, any talk of being justified, whether by faith or by works of the law, if Jesus Christ, God the Word incarnate, is not in that faith or in those works of the law, they're empty, they're lifeless, they're dark, they're just ordinary profane things. The same could be said of the church, of her liturgical worship, her sacraments, Recetical disciplines, the cross we are called to take up, even the virtues we are called to acquire. If they do not carry Christ, then they have no death destroying power, no life creating power, no illuminating light, no sanctifying, no deifying, no cleansing, no healing power. If that were the case, then we could be justified all we want. We could observe the works of the law or not. We could be circumcised or uncircumcised. We could keep the Sabbath or not keep it. We could be as pious as we can be. There would still be in our righteousness and in our piety no life, no light, no power to become children of God, because there would be no Christ in them. We'd be nothing more than potentates, play actors. Whatever life we built would be no more than a potentian village, a Hollywood set, stage set. We'd be just following a script but ends for good on the last page. 
or following this morning's gospel, we will be but barns filled with gold and silver that become absolutely worthless to us the instant we reach the last line, the last word, the last page of our life. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is the power that gives to faith its justifying power. It's power to raise men from death to life as children of God. Or as the Lord says through his prophet, King David, in the psalm, Christ is the one, is the, is the power that's in faith and in the works of the law that makes us to be God's sons of the Most High. Let us understand that the works of the law to which St. Paul refers in our epistle this morning had as their purpose to prepare Israel for the coming of Christ. As St. Paul says this morning in our epistle, through the law, I died to the law, that I might live to Christ. For Christ is the telos, the end. He's the perfection, the completion, the goal of the law. Christ is what the works of the law are working toward and preparing us to receive. They're like the Lord's star in the east that guided the wise men to Christmas, to the most holy and beloved virgin and her child in the cave. And the power of biblical faith that justifies and makes us righteous, in other words, that raises us from death to life, illumined with the uncreated light of God, in whom is our eternal life, the power of that biblical faith is the Son of God becoming flesh, Christmas, and by his death in the flesh, destroying death and building the new creation, creating in us a new heart, building in us a new heart, and putting in us a new and right spirit. Pascha and Pentecost. That means that Christmas and Holy Pascha are the end, they are the goal. They are the perfecting and the completing of the works of the law. They are what the works of the law are all about. The Christ that is in the cave and in the tomb is himself the substance of this faith that is the power to justify us, to raise us from death to life, and to make us to be a new creation. Christ in the cave, Christ in the tomb, is Christ hidden in the law of Moses, made visible. Making our way now to the Christ child in the cave of Bethlehem, and from there to his resurrection in the tomb of his holy Pascha, we are making our way to the treasure that we have in our purposes. <laughs> For when we unite ourselves to Christ in holy baptism, when we put him on as our robe of uncreated light, and when we receive him as our food and drink in Holy Eucharist, we receive him who is the resurrection and the life. We receive the power of faith that is beyond measure, as St. Paul says in Second Corinthians. The power that is beyond measure by which we are justified by which we are raised from death to life, by which we are made children of God, sons of the Most High, the power that is of God and not of us. With this treasure that is Christ within us, we now have the power to build our bodies, our souls and minds, not into barns filled with the riches of this world, but into temples of the Holy Spirit, filled with all the riches of divine wisdom, the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of the Christian faith, dear faithful, is our love for the God who first loved us. In the fear of God, with faith and love, we receive him. 
we receive him who keeps his faith forever. And his love is united to our love, so that we can now do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We can build our bodies into a living temple that never dies. A living temple. Because it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Reading our scripture readings this morning in this light of the power of the church's faith, then, have we not been granted to see mystically from afar the wonder of Christmas? The wonder of Christmas is the treasure of Jesus Christ that has been placed in our earthen vessels, even as he was placed in the cave of Bethlehem. If we desire to walk that path that would lead us to the wonder of Christmas, well, we can come to the Feast of the Virgin's entrance into the temple this Wednesday and Thursday and go mystically with Joachim and Anna as they bring to the temple of God their daughter, the most blessed Virgin Mary, she who is the living temple that will hold God. We'll hear Anna urging her daughter to enter the place that none may enter. That is the sanctuary of the temple, the Holy of Holies. It is the image of the sanctuary of our heart. But we'll hear the Virgin urging us to enter with her into this place that no one may enter. This place where human thoughts cannot pass. Which I take to mean to enter with her into the mystery of Christmas, of Christ's holy past, that is beyond our mind's power to comprehend. She urges us to enter with her into the sanctuary, the closet, the tomb of our heart, that will become the bridal chamber of the Lord's holy past, in order to begin building ourselves in this season of Advent into a beautiful dwelling place of God, that we may receive him with joy and love on Christmas Day. Amen. Most holy, the adult, most save us. Glory to Jesus Christ.